Hi everyone, if I can get your attention, we're going to get back started. I know we're running about 25 minutes behind, but I promise we'll still get you out of here by 15. I'm hell or high water. So um, our next pre presenter is Christina McGrons, and Christina actually, before she went to Legal ABCC, she worked with me at the Administrative Office of the Courts as one of our pro bono coordinators, one of our best pro bono coordinators, I have to say. <laughs> but um, the Legal Aid ABCC stole her away from us, which is all right. She's <laughs> Journal of Race, Gender, and Social Justice. Like I said, she was our pro bono coordinator at the AOC for about you know, a year, give or take. Um, her work at Legal Aid focuses on housing matters, including discrimination under the Fair Housing Act and the Violence Against Women Act. And she currently, currently resides in hell with a few dogs. Welcome, Christine. My voice gets low, just let me know. And if you have any questions that come up during my presentation, please feel free to stop me. I'm absolutely fine with this being interactive. And I know you've already had a lot of information thrown at you today. So, you know, when you have those questions, please just let me know. So today we're going to focus on uh, landlord-tenant basics. Um, we're going to talk about the Uniform Residential Landlord and Tenant Act for the most part. Um, that's going to apply to your bigger counties, uh, Knoxville, Blunt, and Sevier being three of them. You should have a brochure about your Rolta as well. It's one of the uh, bigger, bright yellow ones. Um, you'll also have one about common law counties. That's going to be your more rural areas with smaller populations. You'll also have one on fair housing, which we'll get into in a second. We'll also cover today illegal evictions. And then I'll spend some time covering the Fair Housing Act and the Violence Against Women Act. Basically, these are two laws that afford extra protections to tenants who are either members of a protected class or victims of domestic violence. And then we'll also cover some um, special topics, specifically tenants with disabilities and how you work with folks that have some kind of a health condition that prevents them from you know, complying with their lease and how do you handle that and make sure you're not violating any law. Um, if there's time permitting, I'll have Q&A, but like I said, please just stop me if you have any questions. Okay, the Uniform Residential Landlords and Tenant Act, again, this is going to be for your larger counties. Uh, you can have uh, <coughs> rental agreements that are written or oral. Um, for late rent, uh, you can charge a maximum of 10% of the monthly rent that's due. A lot of times, um, lease agreements will say something along the following. Um, rent is due on the 1st, after the 5th there's a late fee. That um, until the 5th is actually a grace period. A lot of people think that means rent is due on the 6th. That's not the case. After the first rent is still technically late. There's just not a late charge until after the 5th. Um, security deposits, um, they're not mandatory in Tennessee. Obviously, a lot of landlords will charge those. There's not a limit on those under the law right now. And obviously, pet deposits, pet rent can be required as well. The landlord has a duty to provide housing that's habitable. Basically, that's going to fall under three specific things. Number one, the rental unit has to be able to withstand weather. So obviously, nothing like you know, a gaping hole in the roof or anything like that where rain can come through. It has to conform with uh, basic housing and building code safety standards. A lot of problems there arise um, along the lines of electricity and faulty wiring, things like that. Um, it also has to have access to things like running water, heat, and power. <coughs> um, repairs, this is a huge area that we see problems with. And you know, for a lot of the folks that are going to come in through the Faith and Justice Alliance, they may have questions about this specifically. Um, normally, it's the landlord's duty to make whatever repairs are required to keep the rental unit habitable, again, going back to those three things. Uh, but the lease agreement can modify that, okay? So the tenant can, you know, be responsible for some extra repairs, even the ones that the landlord might otherwise have the duty to perform. Any repair requests, the first thing you want to do is tell the tenant, put it in writing, save a copy, and give it to your landlord. Under the statute, a landlord has to be notified of a repair issue in writing. And a lot of leases will say that as well. Um, for non-essential repairs, the landlord has to have 14 days to make those repairs. Um, and 
and for emergency services, it's 48 hours, okay? But all of it has to be in writing. If a landlord doesn't repair, there are some specific remedies that the tenant may have available to them. A lot of tenants, unfortunately, think that, you know, well, my landlord didn't make the repairs, so they breached the agreement, so I'm done now. I don't have to pay rent, and I have to get free rent. I can stay here as long as I want. Not the case. Unfortunately, we see a lot of evictions relating to that. The tenant might be able to break their lease and move upon giving that notice and, you know, waiting that time of the 14 days if it's non-essential repairs. The thing you want to be careful about is, you know, you want to make sure you read that lease. If they terminate it early, even if it's for something like this, they may forfeit their balance of, or sorry, the security deposit, or they may be required to pay the balance of the rent that's due. So you just want to check on that as well and make sure, you know, one of those two things might not be happening. For essential repairs only, now this is things like, you know, power is <coughs> out or the heat's out in the middle of winter, um, they may be able to move and the landlord may be responsible for the alternative housing costs. Um, they may also be able to repair and deduct for those essential services, but again, they're not going to have the ability to just stay indefinitely and not pay rent. You're going to have to, you know, use that money to make those repairs. Provide the notice of that, send a copy of the bill to the landlord as well, you know, showing why you deducted what you did. Um, and, you know, obviously, every time you don't pay your full amount of rent, you do risk an eviction, so that's one thing to be, you know, hyper aware of. Um, a landlord can charge a tenant or even evict over repair issues if they're behind on rent, <coughs> if the tenant caused the problem, or if a guest caused the problem, or if the damages that, you know, need to be fixed would basically require the tenant to move anyway. Again, going back to that, um, you know, electricity issue, if, you know, you have to rip out parts of the walls and things like that, you may need the tenant to leave. So under those three circumstances, you know, if you provide notice to the landlord and then an eviction notice comes back, technically it's not going to fall under the impermissible retaliation statute. So just some other things to be aware of as well. Uh, the eviction process under Eurolta is pretty straightforward. Um, a lot of pro se landlords get this messed up though. So if you have folks that you're, um, you know, advising or representing as landlords, you know, you may want to make sure you're in charge of that notice process or that, you know, they're just really up to date on these requirements. The first thing they have to do is give a written notice of a lease termination. That applies whether it's an oral lease or if you have a written one. Okay. And um, the written agreement cases, you can have a waiver for the reason of non-payment only in the lease. I've seen a lot of leases where they say, you know, notice is waived no matter what breach it is. That's not true. You, know, you can't waive that protection. Um, but for curable breaches, you have to give a 14-day notice. Okay? And a curable breach, for example, is you had a maintenance charge that you were responsible for that you didn't pay. You can cure that by paying it. Basically, you have seven days to cure that breach, or the lease will terminate on the 14th day. Okay? For non-curable breaches, generally it's a 14-day notice with no right to cure. Under an oral agreement, if the tenant is paying monthly rent, again, 14 days. If it's renewing on a weekly basis, it's a written 10-day notice. Okay? But for evictions uh, that threaten the health, safety, and welfare of others, regardless of whether it's a written or an oral lease, it's a three-day notice. Okay? Um, and after the entire notice period is over, if the tenant still hasn't moved, the next step is to go to court and get a detainer <coughs> Um, a lot of pro se landlords mess up this part. What they'll do is they'll send a 14-day notice, say, on March 1st. They'll file a detainer warrant on March 3rd, and then just set it out until after the 14 days in the notice. But because it's a summary <coughs> proceeding, that doesn't comply with the statute, so that'll, you know, more than likely be dismissed on a notice issue. So you want to wait until that full 14 days is up, or three days, whatever the notice period is, before filing that detainer warrant. Does that make sense? <coughs> on the criminal activity, does the criminal activity have to occur off premises or can it be something that occurred, say, in the next county and suddenly? Well, it depends. If you have a, like everything, right? Um, if you have a subsidized rental agreement, so Section 8 voucher, rent based, in, or uh, income based rent, 
you may have an argument there if it occurred away from the property. Um, there are certain exceptions, though. Drug activity, no matter where it goes on, they may be able to be evicted. And then it's kind of a balancing act there. You know, I mean, if it's an assault or an attempted murder, you know, for the most part, it's going to be no matter where it happened. But if it's something like a speeding ticket, you know, that may be something where it has to occur closer on to the premises. Good question. Um, after the detainer warrant is issued, it's set for a hearing. It has to be at least six days out from the issuance of the detainer warrant. Um, if possession is awarded back to the landlord at court, the tenant has 10 days to move. That does include weekends. Okay, for the common law for rural counties, again, that's going to be your smaller counties. And you can have the same thing, written <coughs> rural lease agreements. Uh, you can have the same thing with deposits. The duty to provide habitable housing is still the same. Um, but your eviction process is going to be a little different, okay? Your notice in these counties can be oral or written, okay? Whereas in Geralta, written only, okay? Uh, the timing is going to be different. I'm sorry, this is probably extremely tiny print for you all in the back row. I apologize about that. Um, basically, the tenant's going to get 14-day notice in most circumstances, but they, um, if they haven't paid rent on time, if the guest has damaged the rental unit, or if there's, again, a, a threat to health and safety of others, that's going to fall under this notice period. Um, for all others, they're going to get 30 days. And under these, uh, the lease can actually modify those notice periods as well. Again, they don't fall under your ROLTA, so they don't have those definite protections of, you know, the 14 days, the 10 days, the 7 days. Um, ability to cure default, again, in the rural counties, if they haven't paid rent or if they owe money or if they have some kind of damage that they've caused, they can cure it, but they have to do it within the 14 days. Again, same steps otherwise, issuance of the detainer warrant, hearing six days out, and then 10 days to move if the landlord wins in court. In any county, there are steps that some landlords will take that you want to be aware of. Um, you know, unfortunately, we see a lot of these at legal aid where, you know, the tenant is in the middle of a notice period or, you know, maybe there's been some kind of a disagreement and the landlord tries to terminate essential services. They can't do anything like shut off water or power to make the tenant move, and that's regardless of whether or not they're caught up on rent, okay? They have to go through the court process. They can't uh, go around that by trying to make them move because they can't get access to water. They also can't lock a tenant out. Um, we do see that sometimes as well. You know, a lot of the landlords will, you know, get frustrated with the timing of the process. Obviously, it does take a while to evict a tenant, but you still can't lock them out, set their things out, you know, back up a garbage truck to the unit. You had that one. Minute, so. Again, have to go to court. They have to be notice unless it's waived in a lease in your old <coughs> Detainer warrant, hearing, sentence. Any questions on the eviction process? Uh, uh, quick question on that. What if the landlord believes the property to be abandoned? Okay, so that's that's going to be different. <coughs> yep. now, which may or may not be like the electricity cut off, he drove by three times, the door has been open. Sure. He sure. goes in, loads up the junk, puts it somewhere, and now we'll see the end of the thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's going to be, um, I didn't include it in here because of timing issues, but it is in your Uralta your brochure and in your common law brochure as well. In the Uralta counties, um, basically what you're looking for, um, it can fall under one of two sections in Uralta, okay? If you have somebody that has not paid rent, you haven't seen them, there's been no activity there for 15 days, and if you have other factual circumstances, like you're saying, where the utilities are cut off, the landlord can both post a notice and send a notice to the tenant saying basically you have 10 days to get in touch with me. If you don't get in touch with me, I'm going to assume it's abandoned. I'm going to go in, retake possession. They do have a duty to store the items for 30 days and then they have to, you know, they can dispose of them or sell them. A lot of times, you know, landlords might choose the, the selling route because the tenant, you know, a lot of times may be behind on rent too. Um, but if it's been that you haven't seen the tenant for 30 days and there's also no non-payment of rent, you can just retake possession. No notice, other factual circumstances don't matter, but that's for the 30 days. Those are um, 
Personally, I hate those cases because it's really hard to prove. It's a swearing match between the tenant and the landlord. If there's a waiver in the lease for non-payment of rent, you may just want to go through the detainer warrant and the court action. That will actually be a shorter process, and actually it'll you know protect the landlord a little bit more. And I wish more of them did it that way than just going around it. Don't you think? Yeah. Um. If the tenant doesn't move 10 days after the order of eviction, <coughs> Under those circumstances, what about shutting off essential services or locking the tenant out, changing locks? No, no. The landlord has to go back to court and get a writ of possession. That's a document the sheriff or constable or the deputy comes out to the unit with, serves it on the tenant, and at that point, you know, the sheriff or constable, whoever it is that's there, can, um, you know, change the locks, physically remove the tenant, put the things out on the curb, but they've still got to go through that process. I'm going to cover, oh yeah, go ahead. Um, when they do get that AGB from the sheriff, do they have any stipulations about what type of weather they can or cannot put somebody out in? There's a little bit of case law about that, but for the most part it uh, covers property. A lot of uh, landlords, you know, that might say want to put all the belongings in the street where they know it's going to get damaged. Or if there's a snowstorm in the middle of the writ of possession being executed, you know, if there's something like a carport you can put those belongings under, they have a duty to do that. They can't be malicious about it, you know, knowing that the belongings are going to be damaged or, you know, lost in weather. Um, but that's the extent of it that I've seen. Terry, Jane, you all? No. Right. <coughs> is that once the sheriff gets a writ of possession, they'll actually send their own notice to the tenant. And for the most part, what they'll do is say, you know, in two days we'll be there. So, you know, use those extra two days that you have to be moving out. So it doesn't happen, you know, a whole bunch where that's an issue. Okay, so the Fair Housing Act, like I said, I'm going to cover this pretty quickly. You also have another brochure about that. Um, and these materials, Sam Louise, are on the AOC website, right? Okay. okay. <laughs> Your legal authority, um, you have <coughs> state and federal acts on these. Um, basically, the goal is to afford everybody equal housing rights, regardless of their status in a protected class. Um, and, you know, to prohibit any form of discrimination that might occur on the basis of that status in a protected class. And there are some potential areas of overlap as well. The Violence Against Women Act being one of them, the ADA, and also the uh, rules and regulations of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Again, like we were talking about with the subsidized tenants, generally the rule is that they're going to have more protections than what I'm about to cover, but the ones that I cover are going to apply to everybody. Okay, okay the protected classes are right here. I won't go through them, but for the most part, um, I would say the ones that I see the most often are gender and disability, so I'll spend probably the majority of the time on that, but obviously there are plenty of other issues that have come up. I had a client um, about a year ago who she had gotten married, and she was white, but she had married, I think, a Middle Eastern man, and the landlord refused to look this man in the face, wouldn't shake his hand, refused to add him to the lease. I mean, it was just awful, so luckily we were able to get that one worked out, but that one was pretty over, and luckily um, <coughs> seems to be fairly rare uh, cases. Oh, and uh, exciting point here, um, HUD may soon add additional protections, again, for the subsidized tenants on things like gender identity and sexual orientation with all the laws that have been changing there, so that may be added soon. It's right now still just a proposal, but hopefully we'll see that soon. <coughs> okay, your covered markets. Basically, the Fair Housing Act covers dwellings, so that's really broad, right? It's going to cover your subsidized tenants, your private landlords, just about everybody. Um, there are some exceptions, though, for nonprofits and churches, so, um, but they're pretty narrow. It's going to cover your rental, sale, and use of the unit. Um, and it's going to cover other markets as well, um, you know, publishers of ads concerning housing, insurance, things like that. Um, basically, any type of a market that might have an impact on housing is required to uh, refrain from discrimination and comply with that. Okay, examples of... Uh, basically, applying different terms to one person versus another because of status in a protected class. Uh, you know, evictions.
just, you know, evicting somebody for being in a protected class. Um, lying about availability, uh, block busting. Block busting um, is not really going to apply to tenants quite as much. It's going to be more in the sales area. <laughs> Basically, this is where you have um, one real estate agent who gets two commissions on two sides of a sale and a, a purchase. So the example is, um, you know, a real estate agent going up to somebody um, who then proceeds to say something along the lines of, you know, you had a Hispanic family move in right down the street. I mean, that is going to kill your property values. Let me help you sell this house, and I'll help you buy one, too. So, you know, changing the identity of a neighborhood based on uh, those types of facts. Um, harassing and intimidating people based on their status in, as a member of a protected class. We see um, some of it, some recent case law on what we call quid pro quo um, evictions. Uh, basically, a lot of um, shelters, unfortunately, who um, you know may have some kind of a corrupt member or employee there who demands sexual favors in exchange for rent and things like that. That's going to fall under here, thank God, as a protection. Um, refusing to allow reasonable modifications or accommodations for a tenant who has a disability. I'll cover that more later because it's a pretty, um, pretty detail-oriented topic but then there's of course that catch-all you know that may not be a complete list and you know there may be something else that comes up that you want to argue uh, creates a, a burden on a member of a protected class okay so disabilities and handicaps <coughs> basically uh, they're defined the same I think federal uses handicap Tennessee uses disability but they're defined the same basically it's just some kind of a medical condition that interferes substantially with major life activities. <coughs> so um, one thing you want to be aware of um, is that you know you can also have a tenant who has some kind of a record of that impairment or who's treated as having one. You know sometimes the landlord might say something along the lines of, "Oh, I just got to get rid of them. They're just crazy." So they're regarding them as having an impairment. Um, it's not as broad or sorry as strict of a definition as the one Social Security uses. <coughs> So, you know, you don't have to be on Social Security to be disabled. Um, disabilities and impairments can be um, really, you know, pretty, uh, you know, just not obvious. Um, asthma can qualify you because, you know, you have a substantial <coughs> problem with, you know, an activity of life, which is breathing. Um, depression, substance abuse. That's only going to cover legal drugs, okay? So if you have somebody uh, with alcohol dependence, that's being evicted for, you know, causing a ruckus in the housing complex or something like that. If you have somebody with arthritis that can't make it up and down stairs and might need a ramp or something like that. So, um, there are some exceptions. So, again, the illegal drugs are not going to be covered. Sex offenders, juvenile offenders, they're not going to be protected by this. Um, there's also an exception for when making an accommodation might pose a direct threat to someone else. Um, one of them, one of them um, might be, you know, let's say you have a tenant who has schizophrenia and has been threatening other tenants, maybe assaulting them. You know, you really have to look at those circumstances to determine whether or not that has to be granted. Um, reasonable modifications. Again, this is basically going to be where somebody needs some kind of a physical change to the rental unit. That might be installing a ramp, getting rid of stairs, things like that. Um, grab bars in the bathroom. Uh, normally, they have to grant that a comment or uh, modification request, um, but there are, I'm not going to go through every single one of these, um, but there are some additional things you may need to be aware of. The tenant may be responsible for the cost of it. <coughs> Generally, they're responsible for the maintenance of the modification. So, you know, if there's a crack in the ramp or something like that after they install it, they may have to pay for that to get it fixed. Um, but there are some other protections as well. You know, a landlord might try to say, well, you know, I don't want a concrete ramp. I want one that looks a lot nicer. Let's go with this plan instead. That can be okay as long as the landlord agrees to cover the excess cost. So, you know, if the concrete ramp is here in terms of cost, but the more expensive one is up here, the landlord has to pay for that difference, okay? Um, and normally, um, they can't force somebody to use one specific builder or designer, um, but they can require things like building permits and making sure that the person, you know, is going to do basically a good job, you know, it's not, you know, some cousin Billy Bob that's not, you know, 
doesn't know anything about construction. Um, HUD rules are also going to give additional protections to tenants on this. Um, generally, if you have a subsidized tenant, again, voucher, income-based rent, they may not be responsible for the cost of any of it. So just be aware of that if you have somebody who's on the subsidized um, property. <laughs> if you want more information on that, I highly recommend you take a look at this. This is a joint statement between the DOJ and HUD. It's in a question and answer format. It covers a lot of the uh, frequently asked questions that you know landlords and advocates might have. Um, so definitely, you know, take a look at that. Okay, reasonable accommodations. Again, we're talking about your tenants with the disabilities. Okay. So basically, this is just when you ask for a change or an exception in the landlord's normal way of doing things or the terms of the lease because of an issue with a disability. Okay. Um, the major example is, you know, I have a seeing eye dog or a professional support dog, and the landlord has a no pets policy. Well, because I need the animal based on my disability, the landlord has to make an exception for that and allow the pet. Okay? Uh, again, normally it has to be granted unless there's a direct threat issue, or it poses an unreasonable financial burden on the landlord, or it's a fundamental alteration of the landlord's duties. Um, an example of that, um, Terry and I actually had a client who wanted her landlord to, um, what was it, pay for renovations in her brother's house or something like that? Anyway, uh, they have to be related to the current housing and has to bring the tenant back into compliance with the lease <coughs> and uh, basically has to ensure that both parties are going to be protected moving forward. Okay? Questions on that? Yeah. yeah do these things <coughs> like apply to like uh, a for, for instance somebody owns their own house and they're in a uh, in a HUD, uh, <coughs> HUD or you know uh, uh, homeowner association situation? Yep. Are they and these people who claim they have a handicap to file complaints against the homeowner association? I, I, does that apply to the homeowner association? Yes, and, absolutely. And what, what <coughs> kinds of <mo> <coughs> things would a homeowner association be expected to do? Well, basically the same things that a landlord would. Okay, so um, you know, if there, there's a case I'm working on uh, right now where the HOA is involved, and basically, um, you know, the seller is wanting to sell the unit, and the sale is contingent upon them getting reasonable accommodation to one of the, the uh, terms of the HOA agreement and the HOA has to grant that in order for the sale to be complete so both the seller and the HOA are going to fall under that so but again you know if, if the HOA agreement says you know no pets or something they still have to make that accommodation if it's you know a seeing eye dog or an emotional support dog something like that so, <coughs> Can I answer so your question? If, if, yeah I think yeah, it's still, they're still going to fall under it, and uh, we'll cover complaints at the end, but if they don't grant it, they can be subject to a complaint or a court action based on the Fair Housing Act. So. Okay. Um, the question goes back to protected classes. Yes. So is HIV status a protected class, or is that yes. a different class? Okay. No, no, no. It actually falls under disability, it so does. because of a health condition. Okay. So yes, it does. And there's, a, there's case law on that, you know, a lot of people trying to claim direct threat, you know, being around that type of a tenant or something, you know. So, but you do have to still make those accommodations and you can't discriminate based on that disability. So, good question. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, landlords are not going to be able to ask for basically full medical records to, uh, you know, basically delve into the entire medical history and argue whether or not the disability is real or legitimate. Um, you know, if, they, if the disability is not obvious, basically they can ask for some kind of verification as to why the accommodation or the modification is needed. But generally, a note from a therapist or a doctor or even a social worker is going to be sufficient for that. So asking for additional medical records once you have that information is uh, going to lead to a fair housing violation. So one thing to be uh, aware of there. Um, they can't be charged for the accommodations either. Um, I had a case in Washington County where 
there was a child who was just highly allergic to cigarette smoke, had asthma, and the landlord was trying to charge a $1,000 transfer fee to get away from a tenant that smoked about two or three packs a day. Um, that's definitely a violation. Um, that transfer fee violates the Fair Housing Act, and then not granting it also violates the Fair Housing Act. Okay. Um, regarding the therapy, emotional support, <coughs> service pets, um, can't be charged a pet deposit for that, also can't charge pet rent. But at the end of the tenancy, if that service dog or emotional support dog has caused damage to the unit, the tenant would be responsible for that. So basically, once the tenant leaves, there may be some charges there. Um, and again, the accommodation should strive to put the tenant <coughs> back into compliance with the lease. This isn't something where, you know, you say something along the lines of, you know, I've got schizophrenia, music really calms me down, so I need to play my music at, you know, the highest possible setting at <coughs> the time. You know, that may, you know, if you bring that up to the landlord and say, this is why I broke the lease, but I will take steps to make sure it never happens again, that would be a reasonable accommodation, okay? If it's not a get out of jail free card for the rest of your days as, as a tenant, and, you know, sometimes unfortunately. Um, and, of course, the tenant has to be willing to participate in whatever kind of a reasonable accommodation there is. Sometimes I put together a plan so that we're ensuring that all parties are protected. Um, an example of that is uh, a client that I had recently with schizophrenia where we got him into treatment. He got on medications. We put him on six months probation. He did fine once he got that treatment, and so at that point the eviction was rescinded. Um, but again, you know, all of those steps that we put in place were for the purpose of bringing him back into compliance with the lease. Okay? Yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm a little confused about who pays for what. So, like, for instance, if you've got a house, a standalone house, not an apartment building, mm -hmm. okay, and somebody wants to rent it, but they need a ramp to get in and out of the house, who pays for the ramp? Okay. So it's going to depend on a couple things. As long as we're talking about a private landlord and not a subsidized landlord, yes. the tenant may be responsible for that, okay? So for the cost of that, putting it in, the cost of maintaining it. But again, if the landlord wants <coughs> some kind of a super, you know, nice ramp where, you know, it's yeah. more aesthetically pleasing, they may have to pay for that difference. Okay. Okay. Um, but there are some... Um, some differences uh, in terms of the construction and whether it complies with federal regulations on that. If it was built I think <coughs> after March of 1991, it has to comply with those standards. And if the modification is needed because it doesn't comply with those standards, um, there are a lot of people that can be on the hook for that. The landlord, the you know construction company, the designer, the architect, you know. All those folks may have to uh, share that cost if it's because it didn't comply with those standards. Does that make sense? Yeah, that okay. makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Again, some additional joint statements on these issues. There's one specifically on service animals versus emotional support animals that's really helpful, and one on just the generic accommodations that you know may or may not involve you know service animals or something like that. So definitely check those out. Um, I think I've probably gone through these. Um, oh, the second one. I had a tenant who had um, mental illness but then had also sustained some traumatic brain injury. And unfortunately, she just could never remember when or even if she had paid rent. So it was an ongoing problem. Both parties were really frustrated with each other. So um, when I got involved, what I did was I asked for probation of six months from the landlord well, we took the time to get a member of her family established as a representative payee so that the rent payee, you know, could receive the funds, pay the rent for the tenant, and then that way she could continue on her lease, but in compliance with it. And so that was one we put in place, which, as far as I know, has been working great. So, and then the asthma example we've already talked about. Um, best practices, um, you know, I always tell people every time they're asking for some kind of an accommodation or a modification, put it in writing, save a copy, uh, just so all parties are protected. But it doesn't have to be requested in writing. And they, the tenant doesn't have to use any key terms either. They don't have to use the phrase reasonable accommodation. You know, if they just say, hey, you know, I'm having a hard time with substance abuse, but I'm going to get treatment right now. Can we please just put things on hold? And I promise I'll get back into compliance on things. 
that's going to be clear to the landlord that, or should be, that they're seeking a reasonable accommodation. Okay? So that should be enough even if it's just verbal. Um, if there's something that's being asked for um, that might get denied, you may want to also advise the tenant to um, say something along the lines of, if this isn't granted, I'm requesting a meeting with you so we can talk about some reasonable alternatives. You may also want to ask them to uh, give the landlord a deadline. Typically, I ask them to consider it and grant or deny it within 30 days. And if they deny it, to, uh, like I said, set up a meeting with me about it. Um, and going back to your question, um, if it's denied or even ignored, um, they can file a complaint. Uh, depending on what type of housing you have, whether it's private or subsidized, it may go to the HRC, it may go to the Office of Civil, uh, Civil Rights for tax credit based housing, or it might go to HUD. So. All right. Oh, yeah. It, it, but if, if they, for instance, just file a complaint with HUD or a THRC and never make any previous uh, request for any kind of accommodation, is that? So they just do it because they file pro frivolous pro se cases all over. Sure, sure. Normally, what happens there, um, it's an eight step process over the life of the fair housing complaint. So, first, what will happen is that there will be a review of the, the information, there will be an investigation, and then before any type of a hearing or penalties or anything like that, they'll actually set up a conciliation or mediation if that one's preferred. And at that point, you know, we do see that, unfortunately, um, you know, where the landlord may have no idea what's going on. But, you know, once they're brought to the table to discuss it, usually it just works out and, you know, both parties can, you know, just go their separate ways at that point. But for the most part, you know, that's going to be handled at the conciliation phase. You know, I don't do that with my clients. I always ask for the accommodation or the modification first, but we do see that, you know, every once in a while where there's nothing asked for first and they just go straight with the complaint. But, you know, like I said, with the conciliation and mediation, usually that part gets worked out there. Anybody else? Okay. Protections for victims of domestic violence, this is going to fall under two laws, the Fair Housing Act and then the Violence Against Women Act, so I'll cover both of those. Um, because the Fair Housing Act prohibits gender-based discrimination, domestic violence evictions um, are going to violate the Fair Housing Act. The reason for that is because <coughs> most victims of domestic violence tend to be women. So if you evict Everybody who is a victim of domestic violence, you are disproportionately evicting women, okay? So that's under the disparate impact argument. And again, it's going to apply to all dwellings, regardless of funding. Um, and a domestic violence victim obviously can be evicted for other reasons, you know, if they don't pay rent or something like that. But you cannot evict a domestic violence victim for noise the abuser causes while, you know, she's being beaten up. Uh, she's not responsible for his criminal activity. Um, you know, if he causes damage to the unit, that's something that needs to be discussed as well. Uh, but evictions on those bases are going to probably violate the Fair Housing Act. Yes. Yes. What if it's uh, abuse going both ways? Like they get into a fight, but the cops only charge the husband. I'm going to get into that because obviously this is a very great issue and. It can be hard to distinguish who's the victim, who's the perpetrator, but we'll cover that, so just yeah, hold on to that thought. Um, this is going to apply to your subsidized tenants. This is the Violence Against Women Act. It's not going to cover the private landlords, but again, they're going to fall under the Fair Housing Act, okay? So um, basically, it's the same thing. You know, you can't have somebody being evicted for their status as a domestic violence victim but not because of gender discrimination, just because it violates the act, okay? So they can't, um, you know, the victim can ask for a transfer, and again, this is going to be in your HUD properties. Um, they can't ask for that transfer basically to get away from the abuse. And they can ask also for the lease to be bifurcated if both the abuser and the victim are on the lease. So basically what they, and <coughs> You know, Mike King and I have done this on a couple of cases in the past where, you know, it's a husband and wife and the husband starts abusing the wife and what we do is we split the lease, we create a new one with the wife who's the victim in that scenario, and we evict the husband. 
So that's something that is able to be done specifically under VAWA. And I've noticed too, a lot of um, landlords and apartment complexes around here, you know, even if they're not accepting government funds, they're willing to do that in uh, private lease scenarios as well. Um, if you have a subsidized tenant and the husband, let's say, is the one with all the income, she still has to have a chance to prove she can qualify for that housing, even if the lease is bifurcated. Now, of course, it's possible she might not, but she has to be given that opportunity to show that she might be able to. Okay. okay. So here are some unfortunate real examples that we've seen. Um, your boyfriend broke into the apartment, assaulted you, and caused damage to the apartment. You know, this is your 14-day notice to get out. That violates both the Fair Housing Act and if it's a subsidized rental agreement, it's going to violate VAWA as well. Okay. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. You were stabbed in your apartment by your ex-boyfriend, and we do not tolerate this criminal activity. Well, you know what? Neither did you. So, you know, it's one of those things that's like, okay, come on. But, um, you know, that one we were able to work out without filing any type of complaints or anything, luckily. Um, and this is a case that Terry and I actually worked on in Block County. We had a, um, a landlord who was evicting a tenant in the private landlord situation where police were called to the unit at uh, 2 a.m., I think, and uh, he was claiming it was just such a disturbance to their tenants he couldn't let it go on. That's going to violate VAWA if it's, again, subsidized tenant, and it's going to violate the Fair Housing Act. So. Okay, preventing how evictions. Is, with how does that uh, go with other disturbing of the peace laws and that kind of thing that if you've got someone that's constantly having the police come in at the morning and the other tenants are being bothered by that, where do their rights? Well, that actually, um, to the extent that it's about domestic violence, is going to trump those ordinances and things like that, the local laws. But the thing that I've been able to work out with landlords for the most part, um, you know, once, once she or, or he gets assaulted, for the most part, they don't want to stay there because their abuser knows where they are. Right. So typically what we end up doing is maybe some kind of a, um, a suspension of the eviction and then a mutual lease termination where they can move, maybe at a time in the future. Um, but practically that is how it tends to work out. That's not a required outcome or anything like that. But it's just for what I've seen, for the most part, they don't want to stay there You know, once the abuser right. knows where they are. Anymore, so. I guess I was just talking about the one that's 2 a.m. You know, I don't know yeah. if that's necessarily domestic violence or loud or whatever. It seems kind of like there is some common sense. Oh, sure. <coughs> yeah, I mean, if we're talking about you know, loud music, that's absolutely grounds for termination, even if she is a domestic violence victim. But if we're talking about noise relating to the abuse, oh, well, yeah, that's, that's different. Yeah. Okay. Does that answer your question? That makes sense. Okay. Okay. <laughs> good, good, good. okay. So going back to your question about kind of how to tell who the abuser and who the victim is, um, what I try to do is find some kind of documentation that shows whether or not my client is the victim, okay? That might be um, trying to get a sworn account of the abuse. Uh, the landlord can't accept that alone. Um, you know, that might be in an affidavit or something like that. Um, there's a DV certification for HUD property specifically you can find online. Um, a police report, again going back to your question earlier, a lot of times the police may not be able to tell who the victim is and who the abuser is. And the longer the cycle of domestic violence goes on, you know, it tends to be the murkier that gets. Um, so what you may want to look for outside of a police report is some kind of documentation of either maybe an order of protection or a statement from, say, a therapist saying, you know, this person that I've been treating since December really shows symptoms of abuse spouse syndrome and you know provide that as verification because sometimes unfortunately the police documents can be a wash just because it's hard to tell sometimes. So um, again common problems here um, an abuser calls police first and said she started it. Um, an abuser might lie to the police or the landlord to gain access to the unit to try to further the abuse. Um, I've had one case where the, uh, the woman was being evicted, not specifically for domestic violence, but because the man that she had been with was telling uh, government agencies and the landlord that he lived there when he in fact wasn't. And he was uh, even getting his mail sent there so that he could get access even if police showed up. 
So luckily we were able to show that that was what was going on, and so we got the eviction rescinded on that basis. But that can sometimes happen, uh, unfortunately, as well. Um, I've also seen it where I'm kind of surprised to use threats of eviction to control the victim. Um, there was one I worked on a little while ago where the abuser was telling the landlord, you know, you need to get in there, you know, I hid drugs in there, you know, she's going to get caught with those, you know, things along those lines. And we were able to work that one out as well. There, in fact, were no drugs in the unit, thank goodness. But, you know, she complied with the police search and we were able to get that result. Um, a couple of important notes. Um, some landlords are under the impression that if you're going to allege domestic violence, you have to go get an order of protection. That's a violation of the law as well. You cannot force the victim to go get an order of protection. Um, a circuit, the Bullock County Circuit Court has also ruled that if you start an eviction based on domestic violence, it's flawed from the beginning. So you can't go back and fix it and say, oh, you know, just kidding, I, I meant to evict her because six months ago she was a day late on her rent. Well, you can't do that. It's flawed from the get-go. Um, and I'm going to leave, I know I'm a minute or two over, but if you have questions, my contact information is up here. If we can cover those quickly, um, if anybody has to say. Oh, any questions? Yeah, I'm going to. Did you mention uh, settling what just be one more key Oh, no, I didn't cover that. Um, so for your uh, subsidized, Tenants, you may have to be a little creative there because sometimes if they're evicted, they either can't go back into public housing or they may lose their voucher. Okay, an eviction tends to do that unless it's an eviction for illegal reasons like domestic violence or if they've shut off the water or something like that. Um, one thing you may want to do is negotiate with the landlord for a mutual lease termination. Um, I've been able to work those out even after an eviction notice comes through. And a lot of landlords really like to have those in place because if the voucher continues, that means they can be moved sooner and they may not even have to afford. So we've been able to work that out. Um, if you have a subsidized tenant that unfortunately ends up in court, what you may want to negotiate for is a set aside of the judgment of possession after the agreed vacate date passes. Um, you know, there have been times that I've been able to negotiate for a little bit of extra time for the tenant to move, and then after they move, get a that set aside of the judgment for possession that will also protect the voucher. Um, so, you know, those are some things to be aware of, but again, specifically in the subsidized tenant sector. Okay. And uh, Terry wanted me to make an announcement. The First Faith and Justice Clinic is on May 8th. It's at the First Baptist Church. Uh, kind of behind Dan Louise there, there are some sign-up sheets there, so if you want to volunteer um, to give free legal advice, we'd love to see you there. I'm sorry, but that's a very good question. 9 to 12. 9 to 12. Okay. <laughs> Didn't have that on my sheet up. Is that First Baptist Knoxville? Yes, yes. downtown, 510 West Main. Come join us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you all so much. Thanks for seeing